Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you just said the title of my talk, so I will not repeat it. Uh, the outline is, is like this. I'm going to make a brief introduction uh, discussing about frames versus spikes. Then I will go through the system architecture that we propose, show some results, and draw some conclusions. So this is a, a hybrid system, as was stated in the title. It means that we are kind of mixing frames and spikes. So it's, not, it's neither a purely event-driven system, and it's neither a frame-driven system. So it's kind of a hybrid thing. Frames are actually used in conventional vision processing and recognition for artificial vision many times by computers. Uh, they use video and they process frame after frame. No? So this is the conventional approach that we know very well. However, the brain doesn't use frames. Uh, our eyes, they don't take pictures and our brain does not process a sequence of pictures. It is something else. No? So we have the retina that produces spikes, and they travel through uh, a set of layers in, in the visual cortex that send spikes from one layer to the other, and, and the neurons in these layers, they receive spikes, and when they receive enough spikes so that uh, accumulate enough charge, they trigger the next spike, which communicates to the next layer, and so on. So it's a, it's, it's a, as drawn here, it's a feed-forward, uh, computational event-driven structure, although it can also have feedback path. Hmm? This is actually what happens in the brain. Now we have a uh, strong feed-forward path, but we also have significant feedback path, no? and everything is taken into account. But it's, it is absolutely free of frames. Hmm? Spikes go just by themselves. And actually, I, I put this slide many times uh, because there is a very interesting work by Simon Thorpe uh, published in Nature in 1996. Uh, the experiment consists of uh, an observer uh, being exposed to a flashing image, hmm, very quick, and you have to push a button to state whether or not there was, uh, for example, a face or an animal or a vehicle, something no? that, that he tells you. No? And, 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 and he measures the delay between the time of flashing the picture and you hitting the button. And that delay is in the order of 150 milliseconds. Hmm. So Simon Thorpe, he's uh, very deep into neuroscience. He knows uh, the number of layers in the brain that are required to do this recognition. And he also knows the delay of transmitting spikes from, by neurons and, and the transmission from one neuron in one layer to the neuron in the next layer. And then he concluded that if this is the delay, the overall delay of performing a recognition, the neurons involved in this recognition process only had time to fire just one spike. So each neuron just fires one spike, which means that in the brain there is a very efficient um, information encoding scheme that allows to process complex information very quickly and with very low power, using very low number of spikes. So this is what is done in the brain. Also the brain has a hierarchical structure, uh, the, the, the layers, extract from very simple features in, in the very first layers. Uh, they aggregate these simple features to recognize more complex uh, figures and objects and full scenes. And all this is done just, and all this can be done just with one spike per neuron for the neurons that are involved in the recognition process. And then this is easily mappable into high-speed electronics by using AER. I will not explain here what AER is because everybody knows, I guess, in the audience. But the interesting thing about AER is that it allows us to make a hierarchical structures, remap addresses on the fly, and we can make a very high-speed system and multiplex many spikes on a single high-speed digital bus. We also want to do convolutions using spikes. And, and uh, the, the way to do convolutions is that when you, when you receive a, a spike from a previous layer with address x1, y1, what you do is instead of just sending it to the, uh, to the x1, y1 address, you uh, project it to a neighborhood and the contribution to each uh, 
integrator or integrate and fire neuron in this neighborhood, you weight this contribution by the convolution kernel that you want to process. If you do this and you, you input the flow of spikes, at the end you will have, at the array, you will have mathematically the convolution of the input flow of events with this convolutional kernel. So this is one way of, of doing on the fly convolutions on an input AER event stream. And also we will use as, as input of our system, we will use a dynamic vision sensor. Dynamic vision sensor, as everybody I guess knows here very well, basically tells you, uh, or, or, I mean, uh, each pixel in, in, the, in the XY plane will generate an event when there is a change of light. Here, for example, we have a recording of, of uh, a retina observing this uh, 500 hertz spiral on an old analog oscilloscope, and we have here the events recorded just in five milliseconds, hmm? from millisecond 27 to millisecond 33. In five milliseconds, we get a bunch of events describing this trajectory. Red events are one sign, one polarity, and blue, blue events are the opposite polarity. Hmm? So this retina was generating 164,000 events per second no? when, when observing this spiral on, on the screen. So this is the kind of input that we want to, to use. Now, let me explain the architecture, the hybrid architecture, architecture that, that we have used for this work. Our goal was to minimize energy while maximizing speed. We wanted to do everything event-driven because when you use spikes, uh, the energy is proportional to the number of events that you use. So we want to minimize the number of spikes in order to minimize the, the power consumption of the system, but at the same time be fast. We use, as, as I said before, we will use DBS, but we will flash. We will either flash objects hmm, by flashing them on a monitor or by doing quick saccades like the eye does. No? So but it, it's going to be a quick burst, no? and we will be detecting this burst and process it quickly. And uh, in order to detect the burst, we will be monitoring the spike rate, and when it goes above a threshold, we trigger the whole system, and we will do our processing and recognition. So that's the, the basic ideas behind this work. And the architecture looks like this. We have, in, at the input, we have the DBS, then we have here uh, a little block. All this is implemented in an FPGA with the digital techniques. This block will be counting, counting the spikes hmm? uh, and, and keeping track of time. This way we know the spike rate. Hmm? If, if the spike rate, the instantaneous spike rate. If the spike rate is below a threshold, the system will do nothing. But if it, is, if it goes above a given threshold, then during that time, it will set a start time of the saccade or of the flash and an end time of the flash. And this, will, this time we will define as our frame. We will not build the frame. We will just have like a time reference for a start of a frame and an end of a frame or a start of a packet and an end of a packet. So that's the idea. And since we are doing this for, for systems that are observing flashes, or doing saccades, there will be quick bursts, like shown here. So this is a restriction of, of this system. So this block will let through the events when, when this start time is triggered, and it will stop the flow of events when, when this stop time is triggered. The second, the second layer will do the convolutions, but it will, it will start doing the convolutions only when receiving the start flag from the previous layer. And it will stop doing convolutions when receiving the end flag. And when it, when it stops, then the next stage will start and compute the, the maximum. The way that this is done is that from, from the first from the first layer to the second layer, we will have one event per pixel maximum. So each pixel will be allowed just to transmit one event. And when the convolution is finished, the, the neurons here, the accumulators or the integrators, they will not be reset. But 
they will be scanned for those that have uh, a value above zero, and the value above zero will be sent using one event, but with a four-bit payload. Hmm? We will use just one event for each pixel, for each active pixel, we will send one event with a four-bit payload to the next layer. Hmm? And <clears throat> since, since we know the start and end time for each stage, this can be implemented in a pipeline manner hmm? to make it uh, even faster. So the idea is to, to, to flash MNIST symbols with a monitor, do all the processing in pipeline, and we kind of define verbally, not physically, we define verbally a, a kind of frame time. This is the practical setup. So we have the monitor that is flashing MNIST images. We have here the retina observing. This goes through an FPGA-based uh, processing board that implements the previous architecture, and then it goes to another board that communicates with a computer so that we can see everything on the screen uh, live. Hmm. Um, the system is not trained in the hardware. It is trained offline. Hmm. So first we do a recording of the MNIST data set by flashing all the digits, and then we go to software. We build frames with these flashes. We train using TensorFlow. Hmm. And then the weights that we obtain, we use them for our convolution and uh, the maximum system, the maximum computation system. On average, one flash on the MNIST dataset produces about 126 spikes hmm, after subsampling and, and thresholding, because we do uh, this I didn't mention in here. When we go from, from the retina to the first stage, we do subsample the original 128 by 128, we do subsample it to 28 by 28. This is now the more detailed architecture of what has been implemented inside the, the FPGA. So here we can see the 28 by 28 subsampling and thresholding layer, the spike rate counter. We have three convolutional feature maps each 24 by 24 pixels with a kernel of 5 by 5. After that, there is a subsampling and then a fully connected uh, perceptron layer. And we take the maximum, which is the recognition of, of the system. All this uses uh, 1,270 LUTs out of 92 in a, in a Spartan 6 FPGA. We use uh, five times 18 kilobit block of RAM out of 268. The energy consumption per MNIST digit uh, recognition is seven microjoules, and this is done in, in less than 20 microseconds while using a 220 megahertz clock for the FPGA. This turns out to be equivalent to about 50 kilo operations per digit. If you compute the same operations doing conventional convolutional processing, this will be what you need with the pixel resolution that we are using, which is equivalent to 2.5 giga op per second, or if you take into account all the energy, it's about 7 giga op per second and per watt. We tried, uh, we actually tested this with a different data set. The first one is just transforming the MNIST digit with one spike per, per digit, per pixel. And this we got uh, on the test set, 97% recognition rate. Also we did uh, with flashing on the monitor and using the DBS. For this we get 96.8 on the test set. Or we also used the, the publicly available NMNIST uh, data set, which is a recording using saccades. With, uh, with the spiking retina, and for this we got, using this technique uh, and this hardware, we got 96.23% uh, recognition on, on the test set. Now comparing energy and, and speed with other systems, uh, specifically the True North and the Spinnaker, what they reported in, in these two papers, uh, accuracy is similar, we improve a little bit. Energy per character is comparable slightly higher to the true north, significant, uh, significantly lower to, to the Spinnaker. Spinnaker is, is also different no? because they clock everything at one millisecond, so you need to take that into account. 
you, and, and this is the, equi the equivalent frame rate that you could process. Now, our delay was 20 microseconds, which is equivalent to 58,000 frames per second. This is like the limit that we could process. But in, in the True North case, they report uh, 1,000 frames per second. And in Spinnaker, since they are clocking at, at, 50, at, at 1 millisecond, for all this processing they needed, uh, they, they, they could not go beyond 50 uh, frames per second. These are the receptive fields that we learned. This is for the convolutional uh, layer, the, the three feature maps, and this is for the fully connected uh, classifier layer. <clears throat> Just a, as a curiosity, uh, we put here the, the MNIST characters that uh, fail to, to be recognized. As you can see, they are kind of strange sometimes. No? It, even for humans, it's strange to decide which, which character it is. And now let me finish showing you a video of the setup. So we have here the silicon retina, the FPGA doing the processing, and the output goes to a computer, and, and this is what you see on the computer. This is the digits as being recorded by the DBS. This is after uh, subsampling and allowing just one spike per pixel. These are the three outputs of the convolutional processing, and this is the recognition. 